Hello everyone, Blue Goblin here, complete with girlfriend in bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, honey. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for this week in April 2012. Uh, <laughs> I'll get over it. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, before I get started, I need to say something here. The pick of the week that I chose for this week, it has an unfair advantage, so to speak, because this week I was not able to pick up the new issue of Amazing Spider-Man due to a shipping shortage, and I don't know when I'll be able to get a hold of a copy of that issue, so please, nobody in the comment section, don't spoil it for me, because I have not read it yet. <laughs> But as soon as I find a copy, I'll, and as soon as I read it, I'll post a review of it on my Tumblr page. So let's get to the books that, that we that I do have. We're going to start off with Wolverine and the X-Men number 9. Number 9. Avenger or X-Men? A choice must be made. Now, if this is a tie-in to Avengers vs. X-Men... Uh, Jason Aaron still is doing an incredible job with this series. I, um, my old buddy, my student, the Mount Vernon kid, is not a fan of Chris Bocciolo's artwork, but I I would much rather have his artwork than um, than um, Mr. Land. Uh, yeah. But in this one, basically, what the gist is, is who's Wolverine going to side with? The Avengers or the X-Men? Duh. What do you think he's going to side with? Does anybody remember Schism? Does anybody remember the shit Cyclops said to him? Does anybody remember that at all? What do you, where do you think he's going to go? But, um, yeah, the storytelling is still... Very, very well, very well done. Uh, that's pretty much. This is pretty much all I can say. The only thing I don't like about this is that it's three ninety nine, and uh, some really good dialogue between Wolverine and Cap. And uh, I'm a little bit off my game tonight since it's kind of late. But, yeah. The ending of it, I just... Oh, first of all, get that tribute up there. Yeah. Respect. And, uh, not to spoil anything, but... Oh, boy. <laughs> I really didn't know what else to say about this book. It's just the same stuff, the same style of storytelling that Jason Aaron is known for, especially with Wolverine and Chris Bocciolo's artwork. It's good in my opinion, just not great. But there you go. Still, still a fun series. But basically, all we all we get is psh, Wolverine sides with the Avengers, which leads us to this. Avengers vs. X-Men round two. Um, oh, I forgot to I forgot to mention uh, my student Mount Vernon kid just posted a Skype conversation between himself, myself, my girlfriend, and Deadpool Zilla. It's a little there's some minor technical problems in you know in the middle and around the end of it, but. It was a very fun experience, and this was one of the millions of random nerd things that we talked about was AVX. And in that video I mentioned, I gave Corn TV a, a minor plug, and and I stay, and what he said in, about this, I kind of got to agree with him. It feels like Civil War light. You know, it just feels like another, another cheap rendition of Civil War. I said... In the video with Chris, I said this is a little bit overhyped because you know the Avengers have got a movie coming out in a couple of weeks, and 
got to have as much Avengers rammed down our throats as humanly possible. But overall, I've got to say, this surprised me. This is actually really, really good. Uh, Jason Aaron is writing this, as well as Wolverine and the X-Men. I reviewed Wolverine and the X-Men first. Well, I wouldn't really call that a review. I just said it was... I just said it was good. That was pretty much all I said. But I chose to talk about that book first because it takes place before this. Uh, some nice, uh, um, some nice entrances into the fight from both sides of the team, especially with uh, with uh, Quicksilver and who he chooses to side with. Can't say I'm really surprised, uh, but you know, Cyclops does something in here. And from I, I just want to say that anytime I see Cyclops in a book, I think to myself, it's time to press the douche button. You know, and it's I don't understand why Marvel is making Cyclops such a dick. It, this is going to develop Cyclops into a villain because in the first issue. Magneto even says it, you know, Cyclops, you're starting to sound like me. Uh, it's it's only getting worse. And if that wasn't bad enough, the only thing in this book that really chaps my ass is Cyclops does a cowardly thing in here. Or at least that's what the panels that's how at least that's how the panels are drawn to make it look that way. But during the struggle between Cap and Cyclops, Scott sees Wolverine trying to get through a bunch of X-Men to get to Hope, and he's not using his claws, he's using his fists, or he's simply trying to get through them without hurting them. And Cyclops, it, the way the, the panels are drawn and designed, it makes it look like Cyclops used his optic blast to hit Wolverine in the back like a goddamn coward. And I'm like, fuck you, Marvel. It's bad enough you made Cyclops a dig, but you also got to make him a pussy of a fighter. No, it just—it's like Marvel is actually trying to make us, you know, hate Cyclops with a almost, almost I gotta say like a bloodlust or something. It's just getting ridiculous. But the rest of the storytelling was fantastic, good, good action. Uh, and the oh the end of the book, Ugh. can't I, I'm not gonna say anything about the end. All I'm gonna say is woo. That's all I'm gonna say is woo. Oh <laughs> woo. All right, moving on. Venom number sixteen. Once again, I apologize if I seem like I'm out of it. It's damn near midnight. I'm tired, but I wanted to go ahead and try and get this done. <sighs> And I'm thankful my baby understands. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Venom number sixteen. This is um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I I saw I now I saw Mark review this book before I read it, and then once I read it, I was like, okay, now I know why he made why he praised this book so much. He didn't make it a comic of the week, but he praised it really well, and I can easily understand why. Uh, yes, this is basic. This has nothing to do. Almost nothing to do with Flash's personal life. Nothing at all. This is Venom. We're we're gonna go with Venom here, and this is basically a, a one on one on one. It's like a triple threat match. You know, we got Venom versus Human Fly versus the Hobgoblin. Now, yeah, Cor Mark was right. We haven't seen the Hobgoblin in quite a while, and it's nice to see him again, despite the despite the rather insulting way he came about, but. Uh, when he, when this new Hobgoblin first emerged in the comics, but yeah, the human fly in here is done very well. I almost want to say he, uh, he's basically the main focus of the book, while as you know, and he's having to deal with both Venom and the Hobgoblin, and it all ties up to the Kingpin, and you know, we all know how powerful Kingpin is. We know if he wants something done, it's gonna get done, and. Human Fly tries to reason with Flash and say, "Hey, look, the uh, Kingpin. I owe Kingpin money. I need to get. I need to get out of here." And he's 
human flies in captivity he's saying i need to get out of here i need you to let me go so i can go get the means and get the money to go pay kingpin off because he's kingpin and he he's telling venom that he's after a certain someone in human fly in human flies life i'm not going to give that part away and he says before i if you choose to let me go i promise i will be back and i will and I will return and I will turn myself in. He says, and I will. And Flash reluctantly agrees to let him go throughout. And he reluctantly agrees after a humongously action-packed fight that really gets brutal and it really gets ugly. And it's just awesome all the way through. And Human Flash says, before I go, I need to tell you, there's a letter that I got stashed away that I need you to read. And it involves this certain someone that Human Fly keeps talking about. And Flash lets him go. Then he goes to read the letter. And when we see that letter, I I drop my hands and I drop the book and I go, You motherfucker. Wow. This was incredible. A, a nice a nice old school twist. It's one of those it's one of those I can't believe he fell for that moment. Yeah, and it's it's awesome. Still one of the best books that Marvel's got going for him. All right, we're gonna end Marvel's run with X Factor number two thirty four. Yeah, the the covers got it right. This is between uh, M and Layla Miller. Oh, when the team finds out that Madrix isn't exactly dead, but. Layla's trying to explain to herself she didn't bring Madrix back. And all I'm gonna say is the we get we still get some of them very comedic, very perfectly timed comedic moments between the members of the team. Uh the scene with uh M and Layla on top of the Empire State Building, that was a really good moment for di uh dialogue and story, progressing the storytelling and the character development is very well done. I really appreciated that. Uh, the demons in hell uh, angle in the story, don't really know what that has to do with it right now, but when this series further progresses, I have a feeling we're going to get much more into that angle. But the selling point, the selling point is the storytelling. It doesn't really focus that much on action, but it's still one of the best books that Marvel's got. It, just like Venom, this still has not lost any any sparkle. Very, very well done, Peter David. I'm giving you props. This is really good. Good job. I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm going to say it's just if you've been collecting X Factor so far. It's still the same, some of the same stuff that you loved or stuff that got your attention, and it's just great. Moving on to DC, we got Batman Odyssey Volume 2, Number 7. This is it. This series is finally over. Somebody on the internet, and I don't remember where I read this, they said... This is the end to the best, worst Batman story ever. <laughs> and that's a very unique way to put it because this was not necessary. <laughs> this whole story. I got it because I was such a nerd for Neil Adams' art from back in the day. And then I heard about this. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to get this. And then I started reading it. And I'm like, why did I get this? But I wanted to complete the I wanted to complete the story. I was halfway through, then the relaunch happened, then this got delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, and DC finally decides to pump the rest of the of the story out. I read this and I'm like, thank God this shit is over. The artwork was only good at certain parts, but I have to I have to admit this was a pretty damn good ending to this story the final issue of this of this series turns out to be the best one in my opinion with a couple of two page spreads that were simply phenomenal and something that seems so so out of character for Batman 
It was a jaw dropper when I saw the first two page spread. Then the second two page spread told another portion of the story very well. Didn't need any dialogue. Just the two the two two page spreads summed summed up an intimi the intimidation factor for Batman. Yes, it turned out to be a little bit turned out to be a cop out after the result was done, but woo. I will admit, my jaw dropped when I looked at the first two page spread. Very, very nice. And even the Joker looks, even the Joker was surprised. He's going, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. It's like, it, it, it's like it was a fight, of, it was a, it was a full blown fight between Batman and Ra's al Ghul's son, the Sensei. And the sensei had all of Batman's rogues gallery locked up in like gla in like in like some sort of chamber or something to watch the fight. And when when the jaw dropping scene happens, all of Batman's villains look shocked, frightened, and very intimidated. And Batman gives this big monologue after the moment happens, and it's just wow. This was a really bad story, but the last issue, I should have just got the last issue all by itself. Screw the rest of the story, I should have just got this. But, bad story, great ending. <laughs> That's all I can say. Alright, Catwoman number 8. Oh uh, yeah, Judd Winnick, uh, Adriana Mello working on this. Uh, this is still a pretty decent series. We still got Gillen March doing the cover art. This is still pretty good. Still pretty good. Uh, Catwoman's character development. That's one. That, that, that's. I know I sound like a broken record when I talk about development of a character, but that's one of the things I try to stay focused on. Is are these characters acting true to the point that we know them for? Are they are they acting like the characters that we know? how they should act you know that's the one thing I look for that's one of the things I look for most of all and in here it's still intact for the most part but at the same time I feel like the further this series is progressing the the slightly dumber Selena starting to act it's <sighs> Selena at times is acting like she's completely forgotten about her friend that got murdered at the beginning of the series and it just makes her look a little bit a little bit cold and callous yeah yeah she's a thief yeah she's a you know a villain but the way the story is progressing it just makes her look a little more reckless and a little more dumb especially with her partnership with this douchebag I keep forgetting his name but it's just come on Selena you're smarter than this I mean yeah there are moments where it the development is back up a bit but then it just goes right back down a little bit further I mean I don't know it, this is gonna be one of those this is gonna be one of those series where if if it starts to unimpress me to a point where it starts getting redundant then I might have to drop it but still this is still pretty good I'd say it's still worth still worth reading all right birds of prey number eight uh, Dwayne Swarzynski and Jesus size still still doing still working on this a lot of um, a lot of creative teams uh, you know, changed throughout some of the issue sevens, but some of them stayed intact. And uh, uh, Swarzynski and Size st uh, stuck on uh, Birds of Prey, continuing story of you know. Uh, I could have swore that the that they were continuing the story involving Choke, but they didn't really focus on that. And don't let the cover fool you. Poison Ivy is nowhere to be found in this book. Uh, this is basically. I think this could be basically filler, you know, to, uh, you know, further develop what possibly might have been going on in Black Canary's past. Of course, that's answered on the last page, but I'll get to that in a minute. 
but it's like yeah completely forgot where we were going with the whole choke scenario especially with katana decapitating the guy at the last on the in the last issue and he's like wait a minute this isn't the guy we were looking for and i'm like okay it's going to continue on and it doesn't really look like it's continuing on it just looks like a bunch of uh really psycho Oopla! yeah it just looks it just this just feels like filler to me unless unless i missed a key moment of dialogue where it, it's indeed connecting the previous story but if if there is i must have missed it but there's a major major confession by black canary at the last page and i'm like what are you serious you almost want to go really 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 what uh, dc i don't know where you're going with this but please black canary is a beloved character and she's one of my personal favorite super uh superheroes yeah you know, uh, dc i'm begging you don't fuck it up i'm sticking i'm sticking with this out of, you know mostly out of sheer curiosity of where the story is going uh, moving along Justice League number eight. Will Green Arrow join? God. Um. Yeah, I haven't really been giving Jeff Johns that much props here lately, have I? Uh, I don't really know what to think about this. In all honesty, in my opinion, they brought in Green Arrow the wrong way. They should have. They should have brought him in at the la like like. Let's say. Uh, uh, where am I going with this? Okay, they fight. The Justice League's fighting Amazo in the beginning of the book, um, and it just—it just so happens that just Green Arrow's just there with him. No explanation as to how he got there or whatever. They could have they—they they brought Green Arrow in the wrong way. They made him look like a uh, made him look like a pushover coming in, and then. Later on, as the story progresses, Green Arrow's looking like a fanboy trying to desperately join the club, that j join the cool club with all the cool kids in the neighborhood. It's just coming off like one of those times, and it just seems so insulting to the character, in a sense. You know, and I'm like, this. I don't remember Green Arrow acting like a crazy fanboy following the Justice League around. It. And there's a two-page spread of a wink and a nod to something the Justice League had did in the past that we're not aware of yet. That they had supposedly had a big brawl with the Martian Manhunter. I'm like, okay, where the hell did that happen? Uh, and it just... It just seemed a bit of a mess. And I, I can't... There's also some, like... There's also like some hints of, you know, some serious animosity between Aquaman and Green Arrow. And it's just... That and Hal Jordan is still a douche in here. I don't really know what to say about this. I don't want to say it was bad, but then again, I don't want to say it was great. I just... I uh, just feel like it was handled wrong. Green Arrow was done wrong. He came in the wrong way. I just the Shazam stuff is still really good, but this the, the, it just is what it is for me. I, I that's all I can say. Green Lantern Corps number eight. The Alpha War starts here. Oh, I I gotta I gotta open this book up and probably the. Probably the first of the awesome moments in here. The Alpha Lantern's Oath. They have their own specific oath. In days of peace, in nights of war, obey the laws forevermore. Misconduct must be answered for. Swear us the chosen, the Alpha Core. Sound weird. Yeah, it does sound weird, but hey, the Alpha Lanterns have their own specific oath di different from the Green Lantern Corps itself the rest of the story deals basically with Guy Gardner and I gotta say I had real fun reading this issue this was great 
not saying it's perfect it's not going to be a 10 out of 10 book by a long shot but this was simply fun until I got to the last page then it's finally at the last page that's when it gets serious the Guardians have a little chat with Guy and it turns out to be not so bad for Guy I'm not gonna give everything away on that but the to me the best scene in here was Guy and John in a <laughs> it looked like in a bar and hostility breaks out between you know them and other uh, other races from other galaxies or space sectors or something like that and Guy and John they, they like the hostility is all building up and it's like these guys like no rings no rings let's kick their asses cowboy style and it just seemed like an, an old fashioned a modern day redoing of like one of those classic uh, saloon fights from the, from the spaghetti western days and it was just awesome and then the last page, ugh, poor John just can't catch a break. But this was fun. Nice. Peter Tomasi's doing a great job. I still prefer his work in Batman and Robin to this, but finally this series is picking up and it's doing really good. Good job. Good job, Tomasi. All right. Red Hood and the Outlaws, number eight. Uh... I was gonna say that this that this issue was really really good, but I don't think I can say that anymore because um, it basically you know Todd has Jason has more of his backstory done. There's some more flashbacks in here, and there's a fight scene with a six six or seven hundred pound woman, and Jason puts a bullet in her head. That's pretty much it. Uh, but the one thing that bothers me, and the one thing that I stupidly forgot to mention when I was reviewing when I was reviewing the series, you know, earlier, you know, from way back when, I think it was like around issue s five or six, I stupidly forgot to mention that. Yeah, somebody somebody else mentioned this on the internet. I don't remember who, but I got to agree. Why is Jason now still holding a grudge against Batman? for not saving it from the Joker and I'm like I could have swore I unless unless my unless my knowledge of DC history is a bit off I could have swore that Jason told Bruce that he indeed did forgive him for not being able to save him he still got that hatred for the Joker of course but I could have swore he forgave Bruce and now all of a sudden he's still talking like it's like I want to get I want to get the Joker back, and then I'm gonna keep Bruce's ass for not saving me. I'm like, what? Hey, Mr. Lobdell, did you forget about that, or did you just say fuck it when the relaunch happened? Yeah. Uh, um. Plus a, a a minor awesome moment for Corey, but this. Uh, 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 now, after this, we're moving into the Night of the Owls uh, tie-ins for this series. But this was this was pretty. This was this was just pretty good, despite the the nitpicking I just described. Time for the pick of the week. And I can't wait to get this done because I am tired. But pick of the week goes to Batman number eight. And yes, this did get an unfair advantage. To, be, to making my pick of the week because of my missing out on Amazing Spider-Man. But this was still phenomenally well done. This is the beginning of the Night of the Owls storyline. Scott Snyder salutes you. Awesome. Awesome writing. Greg Capullo's artwork is fantastic. However, I gotta say, yeah, I'm opening another book because I forgot who does the art for the second half of the book. Oh, because I need to mention their names. Yeah. Art by Raphael Albuquerque. I'm serious, that's the dude's name. Yeah, the first half of the book, the art is done by, uh, by Greg Capullo, and Capullo's artwork is very good. It matches the storytelling that Scott Snyder is presenting us. That dark, gritty action. The, the Court of Owls ain't bullshitting around. They're going straight to Wayne Manor and straight for Bruce Wayne. And for basically every 
powerful person in Gotham. You know, the politicians, the police, the other members of the Batman family. They're going after everybody who's got power and authority in Gotham City. They're going to take Gotham City and take it back or, you know, whatever. And Capullo's artwork matches that storytelling perfectly. But Mr. Elderkirke's artwork, unfortunately, not so much. I mentioned this on Chris's video that we did for Skype. And I said that it looks really thick and scratchy it looks like somebody drew the pictures and then outlined them with a black magic marker and it doesn't look good in my opinion but the storytelling for me was what sold this book and what made it awesome even when he's back up backed up into a corner in his own fucking house Bruce is still able to think fast and be ready for a plan when there's no time for a plan. Awesome. Awesome stuff. This is a great beginning to the Night of the Owl storyline. I can't I can't promise that I'll get the entire event of this story, but I'm going to stick I'm going to stick with it and read what I can of it and I got to say if this is DC's idea of their first big event since the relaunch happened, they're off to a great start. And by the time this is over, we're going to think to ourselves, which event will end up being better? Night of the Owls or Avengers vs. X-Men? If you want to go ahead and answer that now, post your comments down there and let me know which one you think could be the better event. The Owls or AVX? There you go. But, yeah, my pick of the week, Batman number 8. All right, that's all I got, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you for being patient with me, and uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done it already. Subscribe to my second channel, Blue Goblin X. I know I'm, I know I'm behind on doing videos for that channel. I'll get to that as soon as I can. Follow me on Twitter and Tumblr. For now, Blue Goblin. So long.